Well, please keep that passage open in front of you, and you'll find inside the uh, order of service a little outline of where we're going a little bit later. I wonder what you make of this incident in the life of Jesus that we've just heard read. For me, it was always one of the slightly puzzling bits of the gospel. Uh, the kind of demon that is a bit harder to exercise than the other kind. So it's as if you have you know, your GCSE level exorcism and the, the disciples have graduated to do that. They can now handle normal demons, no problem. But here's an extra difficult one and they fail. And it turns out, verse 29, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. They've come up against an A-level standard exorcism and they're not yet at that standard. Um, what was it about these different levels of demons? Are we supposed to understand more about that? And there's endless speculation possible in that direction. On the other hand, here's a passage that would be ripe for the uh, internet televangelist prosperity preacher. Uh, we have the verse in verse 23, all things are possible for one who believes. You can imagine that verse being plucked out of its context and hijacked for that kind of show. And I've just come back from summer camp, and one of the things uh, we did on summer camp was do a seminar for the young people about how to handle the Bible correctly and how to mishandle or twist the Bible. And to try and make it a bit fun, we made a, a series of videos by a spoof televangelist preacher um, uh, called Pastor Gold. Basically, it was a friend of mine, and she blinged up with all of her gold jewellery and uh, walked down the drive of this massive uh, house, stately home type house, pretending it was her house. And as she swaggered towards the camera, it came up with a big rainbow and then the caption, a morning thought from Pastor Gold. And then as she was speaking in a thick American accent, apologies to Americans here, um, it came up on the screen, text now for instant blessing and with a number and then text cost 50 pounds each, etc., etc. So we, we were just making fun of this uh, but actually, the, the script she used for, for this video was taken from actual internet preaching. You can find people with messages like that with thousands of adherents. And this is a perfect verse for them. All things are possible for one who believes. You want a new car, you can have it. You want a promotion, you've got it. You want the girl of your dreams to say yes, you will say yes, as long as you believe. All things are possible for one who believes. Now text in for instant blessing text costs $50. You'll find them on the internet everywhere. But what are we to make of this incident? What's it really about? How do we understand it correctly? Let, let's just try and um, zoom back. Imagine this as an actual event in history. Mark is recording what he's discovered from the witnesses about things that really happened. And you've got to say, to start with, that this is an absolutely horrific incident. He was a real father with a real son in the grip of monstrous evil. Now, uh, the Bible says that there, there is a real evil world, there are evil spirits, there is a real a devil, and yet most of his activity nowadays is more behind the scenes than this. It's rare to see, if ever, um, supernatural evil in this kind of way. Still, it still exists, but when Jesus walked, walked the earth, the evil forces came out to meet him in a very vivid and violent way. And here is a boy, a real boy, in the grip of such evil. And we hear first about it in verse 17. Look down again. Someone from the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. There's the first symptom. Here's a boy unable to speak, but it gets worse. Verse 18, he has seizures. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. So we hear the report, but we wonder, is this exaggerated? Is it like when you go to the GP and say, I've had a terrible headache, please can I have an extra week off work? Maybe it's just a a fairy story, but no, because no sooner has the boy's father told us what it's like as we then get to witness what happens. Verse 20, they brought the boy to Jesus and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. He fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. So you've heard the, the report and now you see it right in front of them, all these eyewitnesses, this boy writhing around, gnashing his teeth, 
and then lying completely still. Jesus asked them further questions. How long has this been happening to him? They said, from childhood, verse 22, it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. This is a horrific experience for this family. Maybe you saw in the news the terrible tragedy on Canmas Sands, that beach where those five youths were all drowned last week. A horrific story. I couldn't read it in the evening standard without my um, stomach turning. Of course, they show the pictures of all the boys happy at school and then tell you in some detail about how the crowd saw the bodies bobbing until they realised that it was actually human beings who just drowned. It was horrific. But no beach holidays for this family. It's not as if they just you know, swam out too far and got caught in a sandbank. Here's a boy possessed of an evil spirit that hurls him into the water intent on drowning him. Uh, on our camp we had a rule that you could only swim between the two flags indicating the lifeguard um, guarded area of the pool and we had a ring of leaders in the water around the teenagers. But here's a boy that if dad turns his face away just for a second he's hurtling towards the sea intent on drowning himself. No open fires for this family in the winter to warm yourself. Because here's a boy possessed of a spirit intent on hurling himself into the fire to burn himself. Can you even imagine what family life was like for this family? It is a horrific scene in the grip of real evil, seen naked, if you like, full-blown evil. Uh, this boy is in the grip of it. But the one thing that's worse than uh, realising that there's real evil in the world is realising that people are not able to cope with it. It is beyond human help. The man says, I, I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able to. You get that again and again in, in Mark's Gospel, these encounters with evil that is beyond human ability to restrain it. In chapter 5, we meet a man possessed with 2,000 evil spirits and the local villagers try to restrain him with iron shackles. But with superhuman strength, he just rips the shackles apart. No one can restrain him. Here is evil, and it's beyond human power to deal with it. But Jesus can deal with it. They bring him to Jesus. He tells the, the evil spirit to come out and never enter the boy again. The boy lies motionless as if dead, and Jesus picks, takes him up by the hand and lifted him up and he's okay. The disciples said, well, why couldn't we do that? Jesus said, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. A, a real story of real evil and of a saviour able to overcome it. Now, of course, this isn't the kind of story that happens every day to us. It'd be very, very unusual in the whole of the history of the world to see evil as, as vividly and exposed as this this period of history when God's Son walked the earth. But nonetheless, evil is a part of our world. It is manifested in all kinds of ways, and it is beyond us as human beings to deal with it. But Jesus can deal with it. Well, so far so good. I think that's what we get by reading the story on the surface, uh, a real eyewitness story with a wonderful message. But actually, there is more to learn from this chapter than that. Because Mark, our writer, is a theologian as well as a historian. So he's a historian because he interviews the eyewitnesses. There were the disciples there. I guess he spoke to them. Perhaps he even spoke to the boy's father or maybe the boy himself uh, about what happened. And we have a real historical event recorded for us. But Mark is a theologian as well as a historian because he wants to tell us not only what happened, but what it means. And he has a lesson for us, and to, to understand it properly, we need to zoom out and look at the wider context that begins back in chapter 8. Uh, this whole section of Mark's Gospel from chapter 8 to chapter 10 belongs together, and it begins by Jesus making this point. I've seen it on the handout down there. The context, Jesus calls us to stake everything on the promise of the life beyond death. That's the big point in the context. Jesus has just explained that he himself, as the king, must suffer and die on a cross, but three days later will be raised. 
And as soon as he said that, as he turns to the disciples and says that if they want to follow him, they've got to be prepared for the same. Death first, followed by life afterwards. Look at the paragraph printed there on the handout. Calling the crowd to him with his disciples, Jesus said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. Now I know this isn't part of my passage. It was preached on a couple of weeks ago, but I know not all of you were there. And it's so important that I just want to go over the ground again. Here is just Jesus' invitation for his disciples. And he's basically saying, if you want to follow me, come and die. Be a Christian, come and die. But it's okay because after you die, there is life beyond the grave. Jesus asks us to stake everything on the promise of life beyond death. Just look down again at those words. Jesus said to them, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The trouble is we miss the significance of those words because in our culture, taking up your cross or bearing your cross has come to mean anything moderately unpleasant that you have to do, like taking the bins out maybe, you know, and you're complaining because it's your turn and your housemate says to you, well, we've all got our own cross to bear. But actually in the first century, you saw somebody carrying a cross, it meant that they were on death row on their way to their execution. So let me paraphrase, here's the kind of way I think that Jesus' words would have been heard by their original audience. Jesus said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and strap himself into his electric chair and follow me. Or if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, fasten the noose around his neck and get ready to be pushed off the platform and follow me. That's the kind of connotation for the first hearers of these words. Jesus is saying, uh, come and follow me, come and die. And you can see that's what he means because of what happens just next, because he says, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Jesus says, come and follow me, come and take up your cross, come and die, come and lose your life. Now that might mean actual martyrdom, and it did mean that for some of Jesus' first hearers. And it has meant that for many Christians throughout history and even quite a lot of places in the world today. When you become a Christian, it means you put your life in danger. Place in the Middle East, in Pakistan, and North Korea, become a Christian. Literally, it might mean that they kill you. But Jesus also explains in the context of these chapters, it means things like self-sacrifice, saying no to some of your desires, being willing to put yourself last rather than trying to be number one. Um, following Jesus' teaching when it costs you, when it might even cost you your very self. But Jesus, it's okay, it's worth it because whoever loses his life will save it. But on the other hand, if you save your life, then you're going to lose it. I wonder if you could... Um, Join me in making this handout interactive, okay? This is going to become an origami handout. It's not very complicated. I was never very good at origami. You only need to make one fold. Just fold over the, uh, the right-hand bit of the page so you, you cover over the right-hand two boxes and you're left just with the now column in the diagram. So you're obscuring the, the future bit of the diagram. You've just got the now column. And let me ask you a very simple question. Which of these two options would you prefer to choose in your life? Would you like to save your life or to lose your life? I hope it's pretty obvious, unless you're mad. Um, obviously, you prefer to save your life. Uh, would you like a life of, um, of ease or a life of trouble? Would you like a, a life of fitting in in the office by being one of the crowd? Or a life of being marginalised in the office for being one of the religious nutters? Would you like a life of being able to do whatever your desires tell you? Or a life of struggling against those desires to do only what Jesus wants? If you've got any sense at all, it's a no-brainer. 
obviously you're going to choose to save your life. Have an easy time in the office and do the things that you want. Who would choose to die? Who in their right mind would swap everything in the world for martyrdom? You'd have to be mad. It's like that Eddie Izzard sketch. If you're a fan of the comedian Eddie Izzard, uh, he imagines the, uh, the modern day Spanish Inquisition. And the question is, cake or death? Cake or death? And they interview the first person, they say, oh, cake please. Very well, give him cake. The next person, cake or death? I'll have cake too, please. Oh, cake's very popular and so on. It's just a ridiculous sketch. But the point is, it's not a difficult choice. Cake or death, I'll have cake. Save your life or lose your life. I want to save my life, please. But now comes the point for the interactive handout. Now fold out the, the handout. And Jesus reveals that these present choices have reversed future outcomes. If you choose to save your life now, then you lose everything. But if you lose your life now for Jesus' sake and the Gospels, then in the future you'll save everything. In fact, even if you're martyred, even if you die, that's okay. Because Jesus promises that after dying, you'll be raised again. Now, do you see then that the, the choices of a, a rational person depend entirely on whether they believe in the right-hand side of the diagram? If you only believe in life here and now, you would be mad to follow Jesus on these terms. But if there really is a future where those who save their life will lose it and those who lose their life will save it, then you'd be mad not to follow Jesus and to give up your life to follow him. But the question is, how sure can we be about the right-hand side of the diagram, right? If we're, if we're asked to gamble our entire life and all of our choices on that, we've got to be really sure about it. And we can be sure. And Mark has arranged his gospel so that these chapters, chapters 8 to 10, are full of reasons to be really confident that Jesus is right about the future. This promise of life beyond death is real. And even this incident with the boy, when we look closer, we're going to see it speaks into this context. Here is a man in the grip of evil, terrible evil, but Jesus can overcome it. But notice the exact vocabulary that Mark uses to describe what happens. So firstly, Jesus orders the spirit out of the boy and it comes out of him. Verse 26, after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. Do you notice the vocabulary? He, he could have said simply, uh, the, the demon left the boy and he sort of lay on the ground motionless. And then Jesus re revived him or healed him. But instead, Mark uses the vocabulary, it was as if he was dead. He was like he was a corpse. In fact, people even thought that he was dead. And then Jesus took him by the hand and literally resurrected him. It's the same verb used for the resurrection. He raised him up. So Mark describes the exorcism like a resurrection. As if to say, here is the kind of evidence that you're looking for. I've asked you to, to make a, a big life decision based on the promise I can raise the dead. But I'll show you that I can. In fact, there's lots of demonstrations like this in Mark's Gospel all the way through. Back in chapter 4, Jesus raises a girl from the dead. Here in chapter 9, Jesus raises a boy who is at least as if dead from uh, his corpse-like state. And in chapter 16, Jesus himself is executed, has been executed, and then comes back from the dead. There's evidence, you see. It's not just, please make this massive gamble about your life based on a religious hunch. Here are the eyewitness facts. You see, that the future world with no evil in it is not just wishful thinking, because Jesus proves it. Jesus can overcome evil, and Jesus can overcome death. And here it is in eyewitness history for us to see. 
So given this choice of um, do I deny myself in the hope of a life forever with Jesus or do I live it up and then lose everything, it ought to be pretty easy to trust him. And yet here's our third point, the response Nonetheless, we find it difficult to trust Jesus. We, we ought to trust him. There's plenty of evidence there to help us to trust him. But we just find it difficult to trust him. And I wonder if you notice that's another thread that runs all the way through this passage, this language of belief and unbelief, of trusting and doubting. And I wonder if you notice that Jesus actually is quite exasperated with people. He's quite stern with people. So um, this, this man comes to Jesus and it's understandable, isn't it? I mean, th here's a boy who is desperately um, suffering in the grip of evil that no one can control. So the man in his desperation comes to Jesus and Jesus' response catches us by surprise. Verse 19. Oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? It's unexpected, isn't it? Jesus gives him quite a telling off. Well, actually, he's not just talking to the man, he's talking to the whole crowd. Oh, for goodness sake, Jesus says, how slow you are to trust me. Jesus is almost a bit exasperated about them. And then uh, the, um, the man explains a bit more what's happened and he says, look, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and, and help us. And again, verse 23, Jesus seems quite cross. If you can, of course I can. Um, why are you so struggling to believe all things are possible for one who believes? And then immediately the father of the cry child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And I think that's a kind of way of saying, Jesus, I do trust you. I'm just finding it difficult to trust you. Um, I have got faith, I just haven't got very much faith. And I'm struggling. And then at the end of the passage, when uh, the disciples asked him, why could we not cast it out? He says to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And here's a particularly tricky case. But actually, he's not making a distinction between different levels of demons, GCSE exorcisms and A-level exorcisms. That's not the point. Rather, the point is, uh, and Jesus being kind of um, subtle about it, it's actually a rebuke. Wouldn't it have been a good idea to pray? But when you think about it, is there any kind of exorcism that you would try and attempt without prayer? It's ridiculous, isn't it? You've got access to the God who runs the universe and you're confronted with massive evil and it doesn't occur to you to pray. Actually, the beginning of the passage is quite telling, isn't it? Because uh, this man comes to one of Jesus' disciples. And I guess that's fair enough. Jesus is busy. You can't get to the man himself. You go to one of his deputies. And they, they ask him to exercise this demon, but the, the disciples can't do it. But instead of it being the disciples who go to Jesus immediately and say, Jesus, we need your help with that, actually a whole argument uh, boils up and there's a great crowd, a controversy, arguing one, one, uh, one to another. And then Jesus uh, says, what's going on here? And then discovers from the boy's father what, what's happened. See, it hasn't occurred to the disciples to get Jesus involved. And at the end, they're slightly, you know, indignant. You know, how come we couldn't do it, Jesus? And he says, did it never occur to you to pray? See, they ought to have gone to Jesus immediately. And we ought to trust Jesus immediately. But the fact is, we're not very good at it. Even to the extent that Jesus is a bit exasperated with us. Why don't you believe? There's all the evidence we need, but we're just slow to come to him. And we just easily doubt. What do you choose in the Christian life? Here's the crossroads before you. Uh, will you choose to live your life, save your life and lose it? Or to lose your life and save it? Uh, will you choose, for example, the easy life at the office? Keep your head down, don't tell anyone you're a Christian. But then at the end of the day, uh, Jesus is ashamed of you for the way that you treated him. Or will you take the more costly path of piping up, um, bringing Jesus into the conversation, getting uh, slandered, perhaps getting grief, maybe even getting to trouble, 
um, and uh, losing your life for him. Uh, will you take the easy route for a relationship? So, you know, sleep with a few people and see who you prefer. If it doesn't go well, change partners. Get divorced. That's okay, isn't it, in our society? Or will you take the much more difficult path that Jesus calls us to? Of sexual purity and self-denial and faithfulness in a lifelong marriage. You know, maybe it's the fact that this is a difficult case that makes it hard to trust Jesus. Maybe we can trust Jesus in the small things. But this is a big thing, this boy with his uh, father. And maybe that's what makes it difficult. Maybe you find it easier to follow Jesus at university. But now some of these stakes have got higher. Uh, maybe you could trust Jesus with your GCSEs and you remember praying the night before, please will I get through, and you did. But now it's your accountancy finals. Uh, maybe you found it easier to trust Jesus with the little things, but now it's the, the phone call from your mum to say she's got cancer. Maybe the stakes are harder, may, may, higher. Maybe it's now the, it was a little bit of grief and joking at the office, now it's you've been hauled in front of the HR department and you've got to answer for what you've been doing, talking about Jesus. Uh, in the office and upsetting people. Maybe it's when stakes are bigger that we find it hard to trust Jesus and hard to take the difficult route to the cross. But Mark says to us, look, all the evidence is there that Jesus can fix it. We're never going to encounter something, I guess, in our lives as terrifying as this kind of exorcism. But we will encounter evil in lesser ways everywhere in our culture. Opposition to God. There'll be times when it's beyond us. There'll be times when we're tempted to the easier route of life lived for the moment. But there's all the evidence we need that Jesus can get us through. He raised a girl from the dead in chapter 4. He raised a boy from the dead in chapter 9. He's raised himself from the dead in chapter 16. It's history. Eyewitness fact. And yet there'll be the times that we struggle. And so maybe we should do well to copy the father of this child who says, Lord, I, I do believe, but help my unbelief. I'm hanging on, but I'm not very good at it. Maybe, Jesus, you're even a bit exasperated with me. Please help me. Help my unbelief. Let's pray together. All things are possible for one who believes. Heavenly Father, we know that you don't mean that we are to immediately experience a life of ease um, and prosperity and riches, but rather you called us to a life of self-sacrifice and perhaps even martyrdom, self-denial. But Lord, we cling on to your promise that actually in the end, everything will be okay for those who trust you. Thank you for your promise that all the things we lose because of following Jesus, we gain in the future. And thank you that this is not just an empty, wishful thinking promise, but actually there is historical precedent to prove that Jesus can deliver on it. Thank you for the, those that he raised from death and the promise that he will raise us in the last day from death. And Lord, as we struggle to trust you, we struggle to live as though the right-hand side of this diagram was real, and to make the decisions accordingly. We pray, Lord, that you would help us in our unbelief, strengthen our faith, for Jesus' sake. Amen.